Get on with me, I preach to this side more anyway, you know. I don't know why, I just think I always feel that way. That looks good. That looks good. That's right, we have a house full of Matthew chapter 8 tonight, if you have your Bible. Miss Judy said, I can greet tonight. You got me some food in there this, this week. I asked once in a while if you're cooking to us. You get that on YouTube? Yep. Let me start over. Huh? Let me start over. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Some of me and folk out there need to hear. Matthew chapter 8, verse number 5. This right here has often confused me. Maybe it's confused you. <coughs> and again, maybe it didn't. I don't know, but it confused me. And this is a parable. We've been studying parables. And uh, I've been wanting to get into some of them harder ones, but I've been trying to save a little time with I can study up on it. How many of those if we preach the gospel in a wrong way, we're going to be judged by it? Amen. So it's always good to be careful what we teach. We're going to give account of judgment one day. So I don't just like to get up to the pulpit and sling something other out there. I want to make sure it's rightly divided and prayed over and studied to the very best of my ability. So I want to turn to two places in the Bible. First, I want to go to Matthew chapter 8, verse 5. And through 13 if you can. Let's stand for the reading of God's word. And I, I got a few different scriptures that I want to go along with it tonight. But uh, it's Matthew chapter 8 verse 5 is where I want to begin. And when Jesus was, in, was entered into Capernaum, there came, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. This, then the centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shalt come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority. This man already understands authority. He knows what authority can do. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another come, and he cometh, and to my servant do this, and he doeth it. And when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them, It followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the... And here's where the parable comes in that I've never really understood uh, until I, really, I, I started searching the scriptures. But just, just listen to it. If, you, if you're not careful, this is to twist your mind. It says, And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now we know automatically by reading our Bibles that weeping and gnashing of teeth represents what? Hell. Amen. So why would the children of the kingdom be cast out into the house of darkness? Jesus often refers to saved people as the kingdom. And uh, anyhow, that's what we're going to focus on tonight. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so it be done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the self same hour. Now, if you will, turn with me to Matthew chapter 21 while you're standing. Matthew 21, verse 33. Matthew 21, verse 33. Maybe this will bring some enlightenment. I kind of felt like these two tied things together. Matthew 21 and 33. Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it around about and digged a wine press and then built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husband took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. And again, he sent other servants more than the first. And they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him, and cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. When the Lord therefore the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? Let's pray tonight. Father, thank you for your parables, God, that you taught. You said you, they would have eyes, but they see not. They'd have ears, but they hear not. Lest their hearts could be converted, Lord, and they be changed. God, we're so thankful that we don't have to understand these things to be saved, Lord. We must, we must have faith in your Son, Lord, and that's the main thing. And once we put our faith in your Son, God, then are you going to do these works in our lives where we can open up mysteries, Lord, and, and, and rightly divide your Word. And your Word is precious. I pray right now that it will not return unto you, Lord. 
Thank you for your people being here tonight on Bible study. God, I ask you right now, Lord, to anoint me to teach your word. God, and, and also, Lord, from the abundance of my heart, that my mouth will speak and my heart may be filled with love. Edify your body tonight with the gift of preaching. We'll give you praise. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Give the Lord a praise for his word. Tonight. <laughs> the children, the parable of the children of the kingdom. Jesus said he came unto his own, but his own received him not. There's nothing worse than to come to your own people. How I many has got some family members that won't even know you? <laughs> I mean, you got some family members you don't know. Uh-oh. Amen. There's all kind of hands going up. To me, I feel like as I begin to study this, the very first place in Matthew chapter 8, and I'm going to turn my Bibles back there so I can use it for reference, but Matthew chapter 8, verse 5, when Jesus is talking about in verse number 11, I'm sorry, and I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. First thing I want to talk about here tonight is an examination of who we are. It's a sad thing to go all through your life thinking that you're saved and end up in hell. But it happens over and over and over. How many knows the Bible says to be sure of your calling, brethren? The Bible says make sure of your election and your calling. Many are called, but what? Few are chosen. And as we go back to the Old Testament and the Old Covenant, I'm just tying this in because Jesus used it. He's talking about the children of Israel. They were called. They were chosen people. But if we'll turn to the book of Romans sometimes and begin to read, some of these people thought just because they was Israelites that they had it made. But when Jesus came, he told them he, the veil of the temple was rent in twain. And Jesus Christ came to give salvation to whosoever will humble themselves before the mighty hand of God. Aren't you glad tonight to know that even if you wasn't born an Israelite, you can still be a grafting in. You can be adopted into the child of God. But don't get it in your mind thinking that you're exempt to go to heaven. And this is what Jesus was talking about. We're, we're faced with a person here that that more likely was not was not of the clique, if you would have to say it, as far as Israelites is concerned. And Jesus came to this man. This man had a problem. This man came to Jesus, and he asked Jesus, he said, Heal my servant. And he put his faith, and he said, Verily I say unto you, I hadn't seen this great faith in Israel. This man had so much faith when he come to heal his servant. He said, you ain't even got to come under my roof because I ain't worthy for the king of kings and the Lord of lords to come into my house. He said, just speak the word only and my servant would be healed. And this man had such great faith that Jesus called it out. I wonder tonight if Jesus was to visit our faith, what would he call our faith tonight? I've heard in the Bible he said little faith. He called his own disciples it seems like the people that are supposed to be as close to the Lord sometimes have smaller faith than people that barely know Him or some that don't even know Him. How is it that whenever it seems like there's someone that's supposed to love us so much, it seems like that we, we forget their love or we take their love for granted? How many knows that God loves us so much that He gave His only life on the cross of Calvary? Don't you forget that. It seems like the longer that we live and the more we grow in Christ that sometimes little songs such as, as children sing that Jesus loves me, this I know. We don't will like hearing those no more, but it's the simple childlike faith that's got us where we're at today. And we need never need to get too big and high and mighty that we forget where we've come from. Because sometimes we forget about the love of God. Sometimes trials can squeeze us so hard that we can't find the love of God. We look for it on the front. Job was a man that he was tempted in every way. And I, I like it in Job 23, 8, 9, where he says, Behold, I go far, but he's not there. Have you ever been there before? Backer, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand, where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hides himself on the right hand that I cannot see. What's Job saying? Job said, everywhere that I saw the Lord, I can't find him. But Jesus said, Lo, I'll be with you all the way, even to the end of the world. It makes no difference. If you can't sense his presence by faith, you've got to know he's there. This man said, you ain't even got to come into my house. I've heard about you. I've seen your miracles. I know what you're capable of doing. 
Isn't it a shame when God's chosen people can't find enough faith to heal the sick and sinner folks is calling on, on calling on the Lord miracles happen? Yeah. And God's saying, look, the children of the kingdom are going to be cast out in our darkness. Watch this. If it's going to have some that, that don't agree with me here and, and it may get it all twisted up, but how many knows that it takes the same faith to heal people that doesn't get saved? Okay. Let me say that again because we're nobody looking at me. I said it takes the same faith to heal people as it does to get saved. Faith is faith. Amen. You have faith in that pew right now. It's holding you up. You ain't thought nothing else about it. Have you? Boy, if we could have strongholds like that for Jesus, don't even think twice about what he's able to do for us. Just sit down in Jesus' arms and say, Lord, I know you got my back. Yeah. Or my rear end, whichever one you want to have to call it. <laughs> You got me. You're going to hold me up. Amen. I'm trusting you. Which one of you thought anything about that chair tonight when you're sitting there? Ain't thought nothing about that. Just sitting there. You don't go to think I'll sit there the whole time. We was all out there on the porch one day swinging, just having a good family time. And all of a sudden, called blue. Swing, hit the floor. We ain't thought nothing about that swing falling. You got to have faith, and faith is the substance of things hoped for. I ain't seen it, but I hope for it. Examination that you're a child of the king. Yeah. Righteousness. I want, I, want, I want to define that word. Some people feel like it's a sin to be righteous. Righteous means morally right, justifiable, very good, or excellent. How many of those you got to be righteous to go to heaven? Yeah. You got to be justified. But now this is where I want to I pull our text from tonight. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 5. Get your Bibles ready to turn. Matthew chapter 5 verse 20. And if you, if you don't catch up, just write it down and jot it down and go back to it. Matthew chapter 5 verse 20. Listen to what Jesus says. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, I'm going to tell you something. These scribes and Pharisees was religious folk. They knew church. They knew how to take communion. They knew how to stand and pray. They knew how to fast twice a week. Come on, somebody. They knew what it was like to be holy, but they didn't know what it was like to be saved. They was doing all this holy acting on the outside, but on the inside, Jesus called them revenue wolves. Amen? Full of dead man bones. Whited sepulchers. They wasn't going into the heaven themselves and they'd hold back everybody else it was. Right. You know, religious people that are self-righteous, they're jealous of somebody else getting saved. Right. You want me to tell you why they're jealous? They scare somebody else going to get their spot. Yeah. Oh, but when you get saved, you don't care who comes into the kingdom. You want the empty hell and full of heaven. Amen? Amen. Yeah, some folks, the self-righteous, scared you're going to get their parking place. They parked there for 20 years. Can't believe these folks come up and take my seat. I sit there all my life. Self-righteous. What you talking about, your seat? I ain't seen a name. Yeah, they are going back in the pew, but that's the one that donated some money or something to it. It ain't theirs. They may have put their name on it, but it's God's. Everything in God's house is God's. If your righteousness doesn't exceed, what does that mean? That means you've got to have it on the inside and the outside. Amen. Some folks think that Jesus came to put it on the inside and forget about the outside. Jesus didn't say get it on the inside and forget about the outside. He said your righteousness has got to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. If you do these outward things that the Pharisees and the scribes done, then more likely you are righteous, but it's got to come out of your heart besides out of your motives. Amen? You're, it's got to come from a love for Jesus, not just to impress somebody or show somebody, I got saved. You see, I, I face a lot of that as a pastor. People come here and they'll tell me, I'm just going to quit this and I'm going to quit that and I'm going to get saved. But they're going about it all backwards. If you've got that big of a struggle with any type of addiction or, or, or problems in your life or sin, let's just call it sin, call it what it is. When, if you've made it this far, then don't try to fix it because if you could fix it, Jesus would have never had to come. Oh, come Amen? And, and that was the problem Jesus told these people. You have got to become blind before you can see. Right. 
Because when I come, you think you already can see. You think you're already healed. He said, I didn't come to heal the ones that are already healed. He said, I come to heal the what? Sick. Right. Yeah. Right. So when we come before Jesus, we must come in repentance attitude and tell him that I need you, Lord. Chapter 5 of Matthew, I mean chapter 8 of Matthew tonight where we're talking about the, the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. These are, are the Jews. These are the people who think that there's just because they was born a Jew, they got a place in heaven. And God said, hold up. That was the old covenant law. And you broke that covenant. And now it's a new covenant. It's the only way you can enter into this covenant where you're a Jew or Gentile has come through the blood. Everybody's got to come through the blood. Everybody's got to have faith in God. You don't have faith in God. I don't care if you're a Jew. You'll still go to hell. Yeah, you see, a lot of folks get into the book of Revelation and they think that, that all Jews are going to be saved. And, and I, I just don't feel like that. You may argue, I'm not here to argue, I just don't feel like that. God's got his chosen remnant. He even says if it wasn't for the, uh, for the elect, the, the time would be short, but if it wasn't for the elect... God's got his hand. He even puts a, a seal on them in the book of Revelation telling them not to hurt these. How many knows God knows who's going to be saved? That's what's scary. God knows and I don't. I ain't made it yet. Amen. And when you get this mentality, oh, I've already made it. I gave my heart to Jesus and I was seven years. You have not made it yet. Don't lie to yourself. Amen. What are you saying, preacher? I'm not saved. I hope you're saved, but we got to stay saved until God calls us home. I got a lot of stuff I got to walk through before I walk through the pearly gates. Uh huh. You got a lot of stuff you got to walk through. Everybody got a lot of, of stumbling blocks of Satan doing everything he can to wake you up every morning, going to and fro throughout the whole earth, seeking whom he may what? Devour. Satan would have to sift you as wheat, is what he, Jesus told Peter. But I pray for you that your faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. Glory be to God. We've got a lot of stuff we've got to walk through before we make it. Don't get this mentality when I'm a child of God. You know, when we say stuff like that, we say that I got saved at a young age. I don't have to worry about nothing else. That's the same attitude that Jesus is condemning right here. And I'm a Jew and I'm already exempt and I know I'm going to make it because I'm righteous. I go to church every time the doors is open and I talk right and I never sin. I never fall and I was raised in the Christian home and I know how to pray and I, I pray in the morning, I pray at night and I bless my food and, I, and all those things are wonderful. Jesus is not condemning holy living. What he's condemning is an arrogant attitude. Amen. Never get prideful to think you're exempt. You've already made it. Man, Jesus warns us throughout Scripture to press towards the mark. Strive to enter in. Not sitting here lazy, boy, and wait on Jesus to come back. Work till he comes. Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2, 8, 9 teaches us by faith that we're saved. Everybody pretty much knows that Scripture. It's not of ourselves, lest any man should boast. Um, Luke chapter 18, verse number 9, gives us an a illustration of what Jesus is talking about. Luke 18, verse number 9. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous, and despised the other. Two men went up into the temple to pray, and one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. Is fasting wrong? No, absolutely not. I give tithes of all that I possess. Is that wrong? Mm -mm. Expected to do these things. And the publican standing afar off would not even lift up so much as his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, sinner. Well, that's hard to say that word. Man. A sinner. But Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalts himself, and we just done a, a Bible study on this the other night, shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. So we must examine ourselves to see if we're a child of the kingdom. How many is a child of the kingdom tonight? Amen. Amen. 
You've given your heart to Jesus. You've confessed to him your sinner. Uh, even in the first John, he says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves in the truth. It's not in us. When we come to Jesus and we tell him that we, we have no sin, and, and if we have sin, we're lying to ourselves. So when we mess up, what are we to do? Confess our sins and he's faithful just to forgive us. And watch this. Cleanse us from all our righteousness. You see, Jesus don't want to just take drugs out of your life. Mm -hmm. He says, why the recovery program, we do these steps, we talk about salvation to start with, because Jesus is just not anxious to deliver you from, from your foul mouth. He wants to clean your heart up, because if he can clean your heart up, then the foul mouth will go. Amen. Amen. Some people probably walk in this recovery program and think, well, that's a weird first step, knowing who your master is. Oh, but it, it, it'll do because a lot of recovery programs teach you to dry out. But see, drying out ain't no good because they have to chew gum all their life. Come on, somebody. I've heard them tell me that. People tell you have to eat candy and chew gum to keep your mind off of alcohol. And once they're a drunk, they're always a drunk. It's a disease. But I don't believe that. That's dry out AA meetings. I come to talk about a delivery Jesus meeting. Amen. Jesus come to break the chains that has you by. He didn't come just to sober you up. He come to save your soul. So whatever you're struggling with tonight, lay it at the foot of the altar and Jesus will take it all. Somebody shout, he'll take it all. Yeah. I'm so thankful that whenever he sobered me up, he didn't stop there. He's still working on me. Talking about attitudes. Tells me about them all the time. You shouldn't talk like that. You shouldn't do this. You know, I, I, I was talking. I was talking Sunday morning in my message, and I was talking about in my childhood and how rebellious I was and how I hated my parents. But after I got home Sunday, I got to think about it. I really didn't hate my parents. The Holy Spirit brought a scripture to me and said, "You just thought you hated your parents." I said, "What? I'm so angry with them back then because why they made me do what I didn't want to do." But God said, "No, you weren't angry. You you didn't hate your parents. You hated their chastisement." He gave me a scripture that he said, no chastisement seems joyous for the presence. That's, that's a scripture in the book of Hebrews. He said, every time that somebody who loves you because they wouldn't discipline you if they didn't love you. Uh -huh. See, people don't like strict parents no more, but it's really the strict parents are the only one that loves somebody. The one that let them get away with everything. Time I got a little angel, that's the one that hates them. Amen? How many knows this generation spoiled? Most of them don't even know what the hell is. Back talk their parents. Back talk elders. Don't even know how to hold up doors for old folks. Come on, somebody. I wish I had somebody to help me preach tonight. Mama used to tell me all the time when I was going to restaurants, son, it's your job to outrun me to the door and open the door because I'm a lady. She didn't act like no lady. She could hold her on and work like a man, but she still taught me respect because she was a lady. Well, no need. She never made me say yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, to her. But you better not get around the elder and say, "Ha, huh? what's ha, huh? ha?" Huh? By your whipping, a uh, uh, hand in the mouth, one or the other. They call that child abuse. I don't know what where they came up with that word. That it ain't in the Bible. <laughs> I'm meddling. I'm, not, I'm quit preaching. I went to meddling, and you love meddling, <laughs> Amen. The children of the kingdom. God has taught us a lot. But anytime you get chastised by the Lord, more than likely you're not going to laugh. You're going to feel like that you hate whoever's chastising you. Guts. I can't stand them. But the thing about it is, you see, when you get fat, and you eat too many donuts, and ice cream, <laughs> hamburgers, and cheeseburgers and french fries and, and then all of a sudden you're called to do some exercises or physical and you can't stand that treadmill I hate that treadmill you don't really hate the treadmill it's your out of shapeness is what you hate because if you was in shape it wouldn't bother you to get on there and run a few laps why y'all get so quiet for? I'm just talking. I'm, I'm still meddling. 
I'm, I'm trying to help us out. I said, us, amen. When we do what's right with God, our heart don't condemn us. We ain't mad at it no more. We got it all taken care of. Because self-righteousness will drive you crazy trying to work to God to love you. He already loves you. He loved you when you was crazy. You still crazy. He still loves you. Amen. Amen. You're funny. You're different. You ain't like nobody else. Some folks will say you're crazy as a run over dog, but God said, I made you like that. Yeah. You're my peculiar people. You're fearfully and wonderfully made because I didn't make no jump. You spend all this money trying to look like this one over here and look like that one over there. And God said, I ain't making like that. Go broke trying to look like this one. And God said, you can have beauty because I made you. You won't have to pay a dime for it. Titus 3 and 5 says, not by the works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of the generation and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Never think salvation is, don't take salvation for granted. Wow. Folks that first get saved, they're so joyous, they're so hungry for God, they stay in church, they stay prayed up, they stay worshiping. Oh, but give them a year or two. Yeah. Then the new wears off for some. Yeah. Is that you tonight? As the fire went out, I love that song they sing. It's never gone out. Flame may have flickered, but it's never went out. Satan will do everything he can to put a flicker in your flame. But whatever you do, if you stay filled with oil, it can't go out. How many of you have ever seen these oil rigs? Or I think that's what they are. Isn't that what they are? These big old things that come up out of the ground and get that flame boiling from it all the time? Natural gas, is that what it is? No matter if it's raining, it's still blowing in. It, it don't make no difference what type of conditions the weather is. There's still fire there. I'm talking to somebody tonight. Satan will throw us all types of weather conditions in our spiritual life. But if you got fuel coming up through the spout, there's going to be some fire coming out. It may not be as bright as the other ones down the road because... Their conditions may not be as bad as your conditions are, but your job is to stay filled with oil because if I can stay filled with oil, I'm going to shine. Amen? Amen. Yeah. I hope you got something on that one. I did. Romans chapter 10, verse 3. And we're going to leave that alone. Maybe you comprehended that. Romans chapter 10, verse 3. Lord, I'm going to read from that. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. There's two righteousnesses right there. God never said when they established their own righteousness it wasn't righteous, but God said it, if it ain't my righteousness, it ain't going to work. You can be self-righteous and still be good but how many know good folk can go to hell? Amen. Amen. Right, bro. I didn't say you wasn't good. But wouldn't it be a shame to open up doors for ladies and, and, and feed? Ain't that what he said in 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians when he began to talk about charity? And he said, you can bestow your body to be burned and, and then do all these wonderful things. He said, but if you don't have charity, it's like a tinkling cymbal and a sounding brass. What does that mean? Just a bunch of noise. Your life is just a bunch of noise. If it don't come from a heart of love, huh? doing good deeds, helping folk out, all that's good. But if it ain't coming from the right heart, it's vanity of vanity, say it the preacher. It's all vanity. Amen. I don't know about y'all, but when I was bad, I was bad. Amen. I did it the very best I could. And then when I gave my heart to the Lord, good came in. I didn't think nothing good could come out of me. And it didn't come out of me. Come through me. It come out of heaven. He's just coming through me. And sometimes I look back at my life and look at me now and say, how you do that, boy? And I say, I didn't do it. I humbled myself before the Lord and he's done it. I've allowed him to do it through me. And God is telling us in his 
word tonight when he's talking about the children of the kingdom. He's saying, do not get this arrogant attitude that you think that you've got it all figured out. Because if it wasn't for my son, somebody say, my son. My son. If it wasn't for him, there would be no righteousness to God. God became our filth that we might become his righteousness. Amen. Well, that's something to think about for just a second. He traded place with us because it was our place to be on that cross. That's right. He ain't done nothing. So the next time you argue with your spouse or one of your kids and, and the argument, how many hate the arguments? I can't stand it. Especially when church folk argue. The word of God says just go on and take the fall. Word of God teaches that. Don't. I think it's in maybe the sixth chapter, first Corinthians, the fifth chapter, when it said that brothers shouldn't go to law with brothers. He said, just on up, take the fault. You see church folk now suing one another. Yeah. Come on, brother. Church folk can't get along. Talking about where you going to see them going out witnessing. You ain't witnessing nothing. Because if you can't get along with your home brothers and sisters, them lost folks know that. Amen. Amen. That's why you can't get a lot of lost folks to church because a lot of the church don't have nothing to offer them. They live that same type of life on the streets. Why do they need to come to church? It's good that we witness, but I'm going to tell you something. If our life's not backing up when our words are speaking, then it's all empty. Amen. Praise God. Any questions upon the examination of your, your child of the kingdom? How do you know if you're saved tonight? I've had people tell me. I, I went all the way preached revival one night out of state. And first night I was there, a lady came up to me after service and she says, Preacher, I don't know if I'm saved. I thought to myself, if I don't, honey, if you don't, I don't need it. Right. Amen. Amen. I, I know I'm supposed to be a fruit inspector. I know the Lord has called us to show fruits, but I don't go around looking at all these fruit trees. I got too much junk to handle on my own life to be expecting your trees all the time. And Jesus wasn't talking about going around in the pews anyway expecting fruit. He was talking about expecting fruit behind these pulpits for people who preach to you because he said many false prophets are coming in the last days. And he said you'll know them by the fruits that they bear. He didn't say go through the whole church, find out what kind of fruit. See, that's what's wrong with a lot of us. We can't get our own house right because we don't. Uh, Anyhow, we'll leave that one alone. That's too much mail in there. But if you don't know you're saved tonight, I sure don't. Amen? Amen. You may say, well, well brother so-and-so said a cuss word today, so I know he ain't saved. Peter said one, and he got filled with the Holy Ghost. Right. So don't be going around judging people saying they ain't saved. Now, I ain't say going around cussing right. It ain't right. Jesus, uh, James says sweet water and bitter water don't come from the same fountain. But I tell you what, you're getting in trouble going around trying to examine everybody else. The Bible said if we would judge our own selves, yeah. and we would need nobody to judge us. Amen? Because we can, we got we got the Holy Ghost, we got our spirit, we got our conscience within inside of us. And how many knows God, if your conscience ain't been seared with a hot iron, he'll let you know if you've done wrong. Yeah. Thank God tonight for that nudge in your spirit that lets you know when you've done something wrong. Second thing I want to talk about tonight is the benefits of the kingdom. By faith in Matthew chapter 8, the servant was healed. Psalm 103 says, forget not the Lord in all of his benefits. Satan keeps us down so much and, and, and the frustrations of life and living. When are we going to get to the place like the Apostle Paul said? Apostle Paul was to the place he said, whenever I'm weak, I rejoice in my infirmities, knowing that the glory rests upon me. Jesus said, my strength is made perfect in weakness, and the children of God keeps our heads hung down so much. Children, you need to quit wondering if you're going to get out of the valley, because we're not going to get out of the valley. And even if we do, we're not going to stay out of it long. We're going to suffer many things before we enter to the kingdom of heaven. But Jesus wants to develop an attitude with inside of us tonight that we don't have to have everything to praise his name. We can be locked up, beaten down, striped, and still give the Lord praise for the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, but I'm going to bless his name. Anyhow, somebody give God some praise tonight. There's benefits in the kingdom of God. Yeah. Yeah. 
Don't give up on those benefits if they ain't happen today. Well, he ain't healed me yet. Don't stop praying. I love the, the parable in Luke chapter 18 where this widow woman, I think I'm right, I think it's Luke chapter 18, verse 1, where this widow woman, Jesus talks about, gives a parable about this unjust judge that feared not God nor regarded man. And he came to the, or the woman came to him and said, Deliver me of my adversary. And he said, No, nah, I, I ain't worried about your adversary. Why? Because he didn't care about folk. And she kept on coming. Ooh, we need a spirit like that with inside of us. Just keep on coming. Lord, you ain't healed me today, but I'll be asking for it tomorrow. Lord, you ain't filled me with the Holy Ghost two years I've been seeking, but I'll still be on my prayer line tomorrow asking you because you told me if I would ask, I would receive. If I would seek, I would find. If I would knock, it shall be open. Help me preach tonight. Somebody needs a continuous spirit, a persevering spirit. You ain't going to get nothing from the Lord by asking him and quit. Keep on asking. What happened to the new believers that got saved and, and got filled with the Holy Ghost and got bold? And, and, and we, had, we had prayer warriors that would, would call upon the name of the Lord and, and empty the streets out. Amen. And would get under the anointing and just keep on praying. And, and then Jesus gives this parable and he says, by her continual coming, that's what the unjust judge said. If you turn there and mark it or take it home and read it, he said, the unjust judge gave in to the woman's plea and said, because of your continual coming, you weary me. I know you done told that child you ain't going to get a no vehicle. But if they keep on asking, please, Dad. Please, Dad. Please. I love you, buttercups. They ain't called me buttercup since you was a baby. You know they want them keys then. Yeah. Amen. It ain't long till you go to reach in that pocket. You ain't even got nothing in that pocket. But you reaching in there anyhow. By faith, I'm going to pull something out. Plastic or something. You got it, bro. <laughs> and you go on and get that little girl. That they say, wrap around your finger that car. I told mine, I ain't want mine to get no car. I'm scared she's gonna kill herself. Everywhere she goes, she dead. You got slow. Oh, Lord have mercy. I'm going 55 or 60. Now, what do you call? What do you call fans? I hate to see it. You're a white car. I'm gonna go with 55. Huh? Put one in building as part of the gas pedal. Continual coming, wearied that man. And so he, he he delivered her from her adversary. But if you go back and read, Jesus uses this as a contrast and draws a picture of it. He says, How much more will I deliver my children that cry night and day? Come on, somebody. He said, Watch this. He, he don't stop there. He said, Though I bear along with it, why the Lord doing that for? He's stretching your faith. How many has ever had God to stretch you? You keep asking to help you grow, but then you gripe about him stretching you. You can't grow until you've been stretched. You want all this dross out of your life, but you don't want to go through the fire. When you light up a grill, all them chemicals that are going on that charcoal for us new generation and old generation. Struck some rocks together or something. I ain't got no any blood in me. But anyhow, when you gas all that, that lighter fluid on that charcoal, that stuff will kill you. Yes, sir, but that stuff will kill you. It tells you when it fail, it's swallowed. But it's amazing what kind of beauty can come off of that grill once it's been through the fire. Yeah. Ain't it now? Yeah. If they know how to cook, if they don't know how to cook. Especially that some, 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 some of the folks that don't know how to grill, they just squirt it and light it, squirt it and light it, squirt it and light it. Next thing you know, your food tastes like light fluid. How I many have ever been around some cooks like that? Squirt it and light it. Won't let it burn all the way out. Squirt it and light it. I believe they squirted it once the food was on the grill or something. Keep the fire going. I don't know, but if you don't know how to grill, let somebody else grill. That ain't even my lesson. Yeah. 
You kill yourself if you don't go through the fire. And you think that the fire is so horrible, most of us spend all of our lives running from the fire when God's trying to put us in the fire. Man, we spend all of our money and our time and our efforts trying to get away from the will of God when God said, it's my will that you be in the fire because in the fire you're going to lose all these attitudes you got. Amen? And when you come out of the fire, you're going to be the person that I wanted you to be, that I created you to be, but I couldn't get that out of you until I put you in it. You can't have a state without a fire. Some folks even half raw. You ain't sick it from each side. You're still cold in the middle. So anyhow, we still need some kind of fire. Don't forget the benefits of the kingdom of God. I'm getting long winded tonight. First Peter chapter one verse six through nine talks about the end of our salvation. And heaven is a benefit. I got to read and I finished up my Bible today for the year in Roman, I mean Revelation chapter twenty one, it began to in twenty two it began to talk about how beautiful heaven was gonna be and talked about the gates and the walls of jasper and the stones and Man, it's going to be a beautiful place if we can make it. Amen. We can make it. It's possible that we make it. That's the benefits from serving God. So every time the enemy comes by and tries to tell you to give up, you remind the devil how beautiful heaven is going to be. Amen. See, if you lose sight of your reward, the Bible said the elders obtained it because they saw it fall off. In the 11th chapter of Hebrews, the Bible teaches us that the elders obtained it because they saw it fall off. We're going to have to learn to see far off. Because too many times we stay focused on things in our face. We see temporal things when God says, I've already seen the end from the beginning. Amen. And sometimes I pray and ask God to help me see things the way he sees them. Amen. Help me see people the way he sees them. Because I'll judge them in a minute and say, no, they ain't right. But God says, I see who they're going to be and you see who they are. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Ooh, that's some good stuff. I said, you see them who they are, but God said, don't judge them yet because I ain't through with them. You just wait till I get through with them. There's going to be some preachers raised up in the house. I know you think that they can't preach right now. They can't preach themselves out of a wet paper sack, but they ain't been through the fire yet. Once they go through the fire, you're going to want to drive your gas to come down there and hear them because when I put my flames upon them, it'll be a fire shut up in their bones and they'll say, I ain't going to do it no more, but greater is he that's in it. Preach tired, preach half asleep. In a hard year, sometimes a war slap out, and all of a sudden, anointing to come down and he take over. I just, I'm just up here, Lord, just use this broken vessel. Let some, let some oil feed your people. Up early, early, early this morning with my Bible in my hand, saying, Lord. I'm busy right now in my life, but don't let me forsake ministry. There are going to be some people in your house tonight that need some bread. Oh, Have you got some bread tonight? Come on. I said it's benefits in the kingdom of heaven. The day the devil tell you your Bible ain't important, you better recognize that it's food for your soul. And give us this day our daily bread. Come on, somebody. I gotta have bread to sustain my flesh, but man, shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. God's word is bread to our soul. When we eat that bread, we're gonna grow. When we get off of that milk. You know how kids are, they spoiled. All they want is candy. Give me some candy. They don't want peas and cornbread and yeah. okra and collard greens. They don't want stuff like that. They want candy. They want all their teeth be rotten. Come on, somebody. Oh, you ain't gonna help me preach tonight. I just got all the melon again. Because, because, it, because it ain't healthy for you. The teeth is showing it. And then they, then they get malnutrition. Cause they get taken in all the sweets ain't bad, but they trying to live off of it. They don't want no bread. Right. We get malnutrition in our spirit, man. When that's all we want is milk. Yeah. Why? Cause milk's easy. It tastes good. We don't never like tasting stuff out of the Word of God when it steps on our toes. Yeah. Yeah. Nah, we don't want to eat grown man's food. But God said you need to put away the milk of the Word and get into the meat of the Word that you may grow thereby. Mark chapter 3, verse 27, Psalm chapter 91, 
Luke chapter 10 verse 19 teaches us that there are benefits of protection. That the Lord protects you. The Bible even teaches us that his angels encamp round about those that fear and love God. Amen. Before I leave my house just about every single morning I ask the Lord. Sometimes I catch myself that, that days are in a hurry and I have to leave. And, and I just get into the truck and I pray going down the road. And, and, I, and I catch myself. Two or three, four, five minutes away from the house before I pray this prayer, because it'll hit me that I pray, Lord, keep your hand of protection upon me today. Amen. Why? Because I work around saws and nail guns and just one little old boo boo, and I could spend the rest of my, my days with no no limbs, no fingers, no no life. You, you just never know. On top of rooftops, one fall, one you just don't never know what could happen. You don't have to work around dangerous stuff. To be in, you could be in a car wreck, you could be in this, but why do I want to stay at home shaking in my boots, uh, wondering what's going to happen, what ifs? And if you always thought about the what ifs, you'd never leave your house. But if you ask the Lord to keep your hand of protection upon me, you go on about your day. And if it's your time to go, then guess what? So you got your name written down in the Lamb's Book of Life, the benefit that we just talked about, the walls of Jasper, the streets of gold, Jesus Christ, the light of that world. Yeah. Glory be to God, it won't be no $300 light. Like Jesus said you ain't got to have no lights. Look at my face. There ain't got to be no solar clips over there. Ain't going to be nothing going to block that glory. Come on, somebody. Jesus said I'm going to light up the whole world. Hey. Miss Judy, you tell that woman to feed me every Wednesday. I feel like preaching. Mm -hmm. Some of them folks that got to work early once they believe don't feed that man. No he won't shut up. The last one I want to make tonight is the destruction of missing it. You might miss a lot of things on earth that's important to you. And sometimes it can be very embarrassing. This year I had to start picking my kids up from uh, taking my kids to school. And the very first day, I don't know whose idea it was, but anyhow, they they started them out on a Monday and then 12 o'clock, I think it was, come pick them up. And my wife said, you're going to be able to hammer it? And I said, sure, baby, I got this. You're going to work and don't worry about it. Larry, brother, you got to keep praying, man. <laughs> keep on asking. Because I even told my dad, son, even when I left out here, I'm like, dad, I got to knock off early Monday for, or take dinner early Monday go get the kids to school. Oh, that's fine. That's not a big shot. I get I dropped them off on time, just about it, barely. <laughs> Anyhow, my boy told me that morning, I think it was eleven fifteen, he got out or maybe eleven thirty, I don't think I anyway, he got out before my my oldest girl got out and uh, he said, Dad, I'll be I'll be right here, I wanna show you where you're gonna pick me up. That's all right, son, I got you. Eleven forty five, I think it was, I suppose to have been at the School at 11.45 or something. 11.43, I'm putting three cabinets together, getting ready to sand it. And all of a sudden, a thought hit my mind. You know, children are at school. Oh, help me, Jesus. And I run out of the shop. I know my brother thought, what in the world is going on with that man? His stomach's hurting or something. He's just left everything. <laughs> and I shoot out of there like a rocket, wide open to town. And I pull in there. And and anyhow, I was late, and I, I felt really bad, and, 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 and then my wife began to tell me, how can you miss your kids? Well, at least I didn't leave them locked up in a vehicle, burn up like some of these other people do, or left them in Walmart or something. I was like, I'm stumped, brother, I gotta get out. If y'all want things to be done, don't depend on a man. I figured I've got some clouts right there. They just scared. <laughs> if you miss your children's school day, it'd be all right. Because my dad used to have a little saying when I was out when I was young. He'd say, "We ten days, you'll never know what happens." <laughs> That's what I that's what I that's what I have to do whenever I do stuff like that because I hate making mistakes. I hate I hate missing stuff like that when I know I'm supposed to be there. 
But man, if we miss heaven, there ain't going to be another chance. Amen. We have got to make sure of our calling tonight. How about, how about it tonight? Do you know that you're saved? Do you know that you're saved? Do you know what you know, what you know, what you know, that if I die right now, not that I plan on getting things right, plan on giving it all. No. I've heard people go to this very church that, you know, tell me I got some things. I know I'm not where I should be. That's what I've heard. I know I'm not where I should be. That's dangerous. Communion time comes, they'll get up and walk out. If you can't eat the Lord's Supper, I wouldn't go to sleep. Because that tells me something ain't right in your conscience. Something's bothering. Oh, I pass. I'm not worthy. Ain't none of us worthy except by the blood of Jesus. God don't want us living in fear that we're not going to make it. He said we can have confidence. In this one thing that he which hath begun a good work in us shall continue it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. Bow your heads with me tonight. Besides hitting these altars tonight, I want us to search out.